So, without further ado, good morning or good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. My name is Liam. I'm a mathematician, having just recently finished a Masters of Maths with uh, Dan as my supervisor on a thesis on singular learning theory and therefore having a look at AI. I'm also a musician and recently, as of last year, I can call myself a professional hiker as well because when I finished my thesis at the end of 2021, I ran away from, <laughs> from Melbourne and I ran to Tasmania to be a hiking guide on the world famous Overland Track. I just really needed a fix of um, of speaking to a lot of two-headed people, which is, no, that's just a joke. Tasmania is the brunt of many jokes. But um, yeah, I ran away to the Overland Track, which is a six day, 90 kilometer hike through the spectacular Tasmanian wilderness. And I actually calculated that between my job and between um, a few recreational trips as well. I spent 85 days in the wilderness last year, which is just insane. It was so incredible. And I'm going to share a few things about that today. Um, before I do that, though, I would like to acknowledge the Palawa Pakana people of the Lutrawita, Tasmania, that I am giving this talk from today. I'm in my house in Hobart. Nipulin, Nipaluna, I should say, and also acknowledge those original custodians, the Big River Tribe of the land that I will actually be talking about today, being the Overland Track, the Cradle Mountain Lake St. Clair National Park. I think that acknowledgement is really important in general, but it's also really, really um, important in the context of this talk. Um, it's very thematically linked, I think. So, as I was saying before, it's been a real privilege to get to do this work. And Dan has kindly set up this world as a bit of a meta overland track. And we're going to have a look at some photos of this wilderness, this wildness. Um, and yeah, I'll try to remember to point out what exactly we're looking at each time. So in these ones here, we're looking at Crater Lake. Um, most of the photos are from the first day, not all, but most. And I think you can already start to see that sense of wildness in how the weather and the seasonality affects the landscape so much. On the In the right-hand photo, there's this bright yellow tree called the Fagus, which is related to, oh, well, it's sort of evidence of uh, Tasmania's Gondwanan heritage, actually. And it turns bright yellow at the end of April, so late autumn in Tasmania, and it's just absolutely spectacular. So Dan asked me to give a talk about the value that I find in wildness. And we figured that we could go for a bit of a saunter, um, to use a word that Henry David Thoreau loves to use, through our meta overland track. So I'll go onto the board. Starting point, I think, is to actually think about the definition of wildness. I am a, a mathematician, if you recall. So the first thing I want to say is that I think wilderness is a subset of wildness. So just to make that clear, there's a good quote that I read, which is wildness is the essence of wilderness but wildness can be found anywhere. Wilderness, on the other hand, is a place that is dedicated to the preservation of wildness of nature. So wildness is somehow more feeling oriented, I think, and that's gonna be a big theme of this talk. So I think it's telling, and I'll talk a bit more about this in a sec. I think it's telling what the definitions offered by the Oxford and Cambridge dictionaries are of wildness. So they say that wildness is the character or the quality of being uncultivated, of being undomesticated, of being 
inhospitable. Of being uncontrolled. Or even being violent. I don't really agree with these definitions. At least that's not the theme of this talk. I think what the Wilderness Society offers up, I'm going to come back to why I dislike those words a bit later. The Wilderness Society offers something else, which is this concept of autopoiesis. Bit of a long word, but basically it means the basic ability of anything living to renew itself. And I think there are two key words in there. One being living. I think wildness is very connected to life. And the other being renewal. So I mentioned Henry David Thoreau before, and he's a, a very well-known philosopher from uh, Concord, Massachusetts, um, about wildness and about the nature of walking. One of his quotes, which is actually on the Meta Yin page, is, well, it's inscribed in another quote, but one of his quotes is, in wildness is the preservation of the world. And I quite like that, but I actually prefer another one that he's got which is life consists with wildness. The most alive is the wildest. Not yet subdued to man, its presence refreshes him. I think that's a really amazing quote. So I think my claim for this talk is that I think that engaging in wildness is the act of succumbing to an infinite complexity in nature that we are a part of and try as we might, we can never truly understand. And so I guess hopefully by the end of the talk, without meaning to be too preacher about it, um, I hope that I can encourage you to seek and value wildness for it is at least part of what makes us human seek and value wildness for it is part of what makes us human with that let's begin our saunter over to the next board So on the left here, we've got Crater Lake in Vegas season again, just another perspective on it without as much fog. And on the right, we've got a photo of the ascent on day one, a very steep ascent up towards the Alpine Plateau. And that Alpine Plateau that sits at about a thousand metres, which is really where the essence of the overland track begins, that plateau feels like you're in a parallel universe and it is just incredible. The ground level, your frame of reference for the ground level starts to feel like that thousand metre mark, as you'll see in some of the photos. And yeah, you just enter something completely otherworldly. So I wanted to share an anecdote from one of my trips. Um, and I'll start by saying that every time I come out of the wilderness, particularly because of not having phone reception for six days is a big part of it, but also just the immersion in these mountainous vistas and rainforest and, and these things. Every time I come out, I kind of feel like I see a lot of people that look like zombies <laughs> walking around the street. And I don't know, you could say maybe they look devoid of love or purpose or even joy. 
And it's been a really telling realization I've had. And I told one of my guests this, a lady named Franca, who's an Italian Australian woman. And she said that after 12 years of doing a particular corporate job, she actually kind of realized that she had gotten to the point of being one of those zombies. And where she felt this the most was she had a really deep love of cooking and she just completely fell out of love with it. Um, and her breaking point, which this will stick with me forever, her breaking point was realizing that her spaghetti bolognese was shit. And I think this is a really telling example. So this trip, was back in October and some of you might remember that Tasmania flooded around then just as so much of Australia has. And when we got a hundred mil of rain one day, we were in the old growth rainforest on day five, which was just extraordinary seeing the rainforest come alive in that rain. I sent a video to Dan the other day and it's just feeling the freshness of the air. It's, it's ridiculous. By the end of that week in the wilderness, I sort of sensed in Franca that she felt somewhat alive again. And in speaking to her, she she said as much. She said she hadn't laughed as much as she had in a very long time. And you could really sort of see it in her eyes that some kind of spark of joy had re-emerged in her, I think. And so I guess part of the question of this talk is like what exactly is that aliveness that i'm describing there and how does it relate to her cooking and the love she has for that or the lack of love she had after her 12 years in that job and how does it relate to the rain and the rainforest and the laughter and all of these things i think there's a connection here let's continue on our walk So on the left here, we've got another photo of that ascent up towards the plateau. And this day, um, the Fagus was still out, but you can see the fog was just so thick and really created a really mystical, almost movie-like feeling. And when you zoom in on that photo and see the small people there, I think it's one of my favorite photos I've taken. The other photo is of Cradle Mountain, for those of you that are not from Australia or maybe haven't seen it before looking pretty specky with some snow on it, which was at the end of autumn. So back to my whiteboard over here. I think it's pretty uncontroversial to say that humans love wildness. I think it's pretty clear anecdotally, if we all just think to ourselves, but also empirically, when you go down sort of a neuroscience or psychology kind of viewpoint, there's so much research about how much better we feel and how much better our bodies respond to this kind of immersion in nature and wild things. And some examples of what this immersion looks like is things like laying or swimming in the ocean and feeling the waves crash over you sitting on top of a mountain looking over a, a range of mountains and feeling the wind through your hair traversing through snow as you can see i've been through quite a lot of snow on the overland track walking you could ski snowboard standing in the rain feeling the freshness of the air in the rainforest as i was describing before or I think one that's pretty universal is the sense of awe we have when we look towards the stars on a clear night. And Tasmania doesn't have much light pollution. And so when you're out on the overland track and you get a clear night, you can just see the Milky Way as clear as anything. And it's just spectacular. So recall what I was talking about before, these Oxford and Cambridge definitions of wildness that was somehow about 
we can't as humans or we haven't dominated or controlled something I think from all my time out in the wilderness I really think that this I think our modern society like seeks to dominate and control things way too much I think a level of it is incredibly important to sustaining human life and to survival but I do think that so much of our um, poor mental health that can happen throughout society comes from our our desire to dominate and control things which I really think are against our natural instincts because if you think about these examples I've written down here they really point to this sense that when we kind of sit in the fact that we are not in control of this enormous complex universe we actually feel some kind of ease in that and when you listen to music to meditate to or something it usually involves the sounds of waves or rain or wind and these kind of things right so i think it's really in our dna all of this stuff and so i'll just write down here that i think that for humans that level of acceptance leads to a sense of peace and ease and i think that the domination on the other hand is somehow bad for the soul i'm going to come back to that word soul what do i take it to mean let's continue here um so another view of cradle mountain on the left there and another view on the right different day that's one of the most amazing things about going through the track and doing this job is getting to see how much the place changes week to week different flowers different weather different light all draws your eye to something a bit different every time so back to my whiteboard over here this brings us to a question that a lot of us are asking ourselves at the moment and now especially the public i think is starting to ask this with the introduction of chat gpt are humans more special than an ai could be so many people in the ai community chief among them i would say is probably sam altman the ceo of OpenAI, which has created GPT-3 and therefore ChatGPT and DALI. Sam Altman believes that the human mind is just energy flowing through a neural network. A neural network, of course, being a somewhat big but relatively simple mathematical equation that takes a set of inputs and gives a set of outputs, mathematical function. And so embedded in this, Sam really kind of thinks that the self, this self that philosophers have argued over for centuries, somewhat related to this notion of a soul, sort of thinks that the self is just an illusion. So I might share a small anecdote here. When I started my thesis back in 2020, Dan and I were having this conversation and I said to Dan that I would believe that humans were nothing particularly special if an AI ever wrote a symphony that could make me cry. And Dan's response was, <laughs> oh, yeah, that'll happen pretty easily. <laughs> and I was, you know, a bit taken aback at first, but within a few days, he'd sort of convinced me of that. So maybe nothing particularly special about the music, but 
when I was then talking to Lucas Cantor a few days or a few weeks later, I'd come up with a new theory. I said, well, maybe what distinguishes us from AI is spirituality. But I didn't really have a good concept of what that meant to me because I personally am an atheist, but I do feel like there is a notion of a spirit and a soul. And in fact, one of my friends in the talk here, Charlie, we were hiking around Yosemite and uh, very much debating this point. Do humans have a, a spirit and a soul? And can it make sense if you've got Sam Altman's view that we're actually not that special as computers? So the rest of the talk is going to be having a think about this. Let's continue on. Where are you going, Liam? <laughs> did you lose the road? I did. Can you remind me? Where we're going? <laughs> oh, some hiking guide you are. Come yeah, on. This what, way. What, the orb's going to be very confused. Ah, oh, there it is. It's back. So on the left there is a photo of walking over the Cirque, which is just behind Cradle Mountain, and you can really start to get a sense of that plateau that I'm talking about along that trail there. And on the right is Barn Bluff, which is um, a very, very spectacular mountain that you really spend a lot of the first day staring straight at. So... To bring this back to the trips, this question of are humans more special than AI, I think I've observed something in the difference between type 1 fun and type 2 fun. So just before I get there, I think it's reasonable to say that the human objective function, what we are optimising for as humans, I think primarily is survival. Second, you might say procreate is what we're optimizing for, but that's maybe a little bit, I actually think that's a really interesting question these days as to whether that is part of our human objective function or not. But once we have done both of those things, or maybe just the survival part, I do think that humans are left with some void <laughs> we don't really sit down very well as humans right once we once we're like you know once we've had food and once we're we've got nice a nice roof over our heads we're, we're not very happy with just being content with that we've got something else in us so type one and type two fun i think is a good way of exploring this because type two fun is really what we're introducing a lot of our guests to on these trips. Type one fun is really a sort of short term happiness. It's kind of like a sugar hit. It's like dopamine. And you get it from things like roller coasters or kicking a ball around. I'm actually terrified of roller coasters myself, but that's a, a pretty classic example of a kind of type one fun, right? Pretty simple, pretty short term kind of happiness. Type two fun is more about achievement and discomfort, particularly in the moment. But 
that all sort of leads to a deeper sense of gratification. And this obviously comes more from things like adventures, e.g. overnight hiking. And masters in pure mathematics. And masters in pure mathematics, exactly. Doing metric in Hilbert spaces <laughs> is precisely type two. Fun. <laughs> Why on earth would anyone choose to do it if it wasn't so satisfying? <laughs> yes, exactly. So why? What are we doing, right? Like it's kind of stupid, but not really. So I always find it funny when the guests we do. I I sort of run these roundtable reflections at the end of a trip, and the guests are always so surprised. They're like, oh. Like you know, usually I'm just like sitting on a beach for my holiday, and and now like my legs are so sore, and like I had all these mental breaking points, but I actually like kind of loved it, and I d- I don't know what to think, and I it really is a bit of a universal phenomenon that I kind of observe on these trips, and if you think a bit deeper about it, it's not just the pretty flowers, or the animals, or the mountains. Because you can go and see all of these much more easily than going on a six-day overnight hike carrying ten kilos on your back, right? You can go to a nursery to see flowers, and you can drive up a few mountains near towns, and that kind of thing. You can go to the zoo to see animals, but there's something in us that really loves that immersion in the wildness. Let's continue up towards the mountain top now. Hopefully, I've got my boards right. the orb so i'm gonna stick my neck out here and say that i think that a major part of what makes us human is this capacity to experience joy and i think that type 2 fun is inextricably linked to this and so i was having a think about it and this is a very loose contention but one that i'm willing to run with for the moment I think as a vector space, (laughs) the basis vectors for joy are beauty, love, and wild, or wildness. And I think all of these are heavily related to a notion of transcendence. Dan and I were talking about this the other day. Transcendent somehow being a feeling that we are witnessing or experiencing something that is beyond human, beyond our understanding, beyond what we could reasonably experience. So having a look at these basis vectors individually, just as a little bit of musing, I think that beauty might be related to finding order in wildness. Certainly when we create art or when we discover things in science, um, certainly to the extent that mathematics is a discovery, I think wild wildness and beauty are inextricably linked here as well. Love, um, I'm just going to say love is beyond the scope of this talk <laughs> for today. I think this really, it it does feel right to me to put this in the same category as beauty and wildness, a um, a triality of some sort. You're chickening out of treating all three of these in depth in a 30-minute talk. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) I'm just going to write down uh, Marla's adagietto as my definition of love for the purposes of today. But then to come back to this wildness, I think that wildness is comprised of this sense of aliveness and physical presence in nature 
when you stare across those mountain ranges or look at the colours in the sky or look at some of the flowers that some of you might have seen on these boards here that are of all different colours, an immersion in complexity that I think ultimately implies or inspires, I should say, inspires curiosity in us. And I think so many of us try and fill that that sort of actualization void with this kind of curiosity and with joy in general, to be honest. And I think what's really interesting here is that the we can see that this is kind of in our DNA because infants have this novelty seeking behavior inbuilt in them, right? They don't just sit there and say like, I am well fed. They're like bouncing around all over the place. And like, imagine blowing some bubbles in front of a small child. It's just like, whoa, what is this thing? So let's move on to the next stop where I'll talk about can an AI ever be human-like in this way? Two main slides left, so I might skip this one and go towards the uh, top one up here. So these two photos here are from a bit later on the track towards day four, um, near the tallest mountain in Tasmania, Mount Ossa. And what you see here, if you click on these photos, are these bright green plants on the ground that are called cushion plant. And the cushion plant are one of the most amazing things that we see on this track. They're endemic to Tasmania and where they're, they're usually found in these really harsh alpine environments and they host this entire micro ecology underneath them and they um they provide quite fertile ground for seeds to start doing their thing as well and we usually have to yell to guests like don't step on the cushion plant because if you step on it that entire micro ecology kind of like an igloo is gone for 30 years it takes 30 years to regenerate itself talk about wild being about renewal i think there's something in that so back to the board oh, come on <laughs> there we go can an ai ever equal a human <laughs> it's a pretty big question so my answer is no or at least not for a very long time why do i say this well dan and i were talking about this the other day as humans we are deeply embedded in nature in this wildness physically we are of nature and we depend on nature and i think it's reasonable to say that we depend on nature to a much greater extent than ai does yes ai requires energy to run but humans both mentally and physically really do depend on nature and i think mentally our mind the human mind what makes it kind of special is that the natural universe and the earth and humans have experienced an interconnected evolution that has taken 
billions of years to get to, right? The the best estimate for the lifetime of the universe is 13.7 billion years. Humans, at the best guess for the lifespan of um, humanity, is about 200,000 years. This is viewing evolution as a kind of algorithm. This is a lot of compute. <laughs> Dan put it the other day that like, this is not cheap. This is not easy to replicate. And I think that so much of the complexity of human behavior is somehow built into this. And I think that our connection and our connection with and our enjoyment of wildness is built into this phenomena. So with Sam Altman, like with his view that the human mind is just energy flowing through a neural network that might be true but it's also possible that we will never see an ai approach a human uh, or the human mind in the lifetime of humanity because it might just take too much compute to get there it'd be really interesting to think a bit more numerically about that sort of amount of compute and so for me the notion of a soul is somehow intertwined with this notion of joy. And if I can just draw a little diagram here, I think that AI is going to be exceptionally good at prediction, and already is, pastiche, uh, being able to replicate styles, and definitely physical sensing as well, and physical processing. And so, my claim is that because of this enormous complexity of nature that we are embedded in i think what distinguishes us is this joy which as i say comprises of beauty and wild and love so if we go over to our top of the mountain up here i'll wrap up the talk two photos whoop, just wait for the orb. these two photos here were Dan's favorites and I think I probably agree the one on the left is of a snow gum might actually be a yellow gum I can't quite remember um, but I just love looking at these snow gums and how they kind of look like they're almost dancing they've got such an incredible flow to them and on the right was one of the most amazing experiences of my life to be honest because i i got to go up the top of this mountain to watch the sunset and eat my dinner on my night off in the middle of the trip and sitting there i realized that i was the only person within about a five kilometer radius at that given moment in time and that level of solitude is is just something something else and so sitting there watching the colors go through the sky as you can see there it's a pretty extraordinary and unfathomable setting i think so overall if i can uh, be a, a preacher for one moment i would say that i think after survival seek joy because i think that is what makes us human that is what makes us more special in the ai in my opinion and valuing wildness which i think tasmania does really really well there's an organization here called keep tassie wild valuing wildness is a big part of that joy so take uh, take the opportunity to remind yourself how 
puny and insignificant you are, <laughs> but also how incredible and mysterious this universe truly is. And remind yourself that to a first approximation, we have basically zero control over it. And I think that the human body and mind is well served by embracing that fact. So go and jump in a puddle or watch the ocean or get dumped by a wave or go and hug a tree or something. Because I think that engaging in wildness reminds us of how great it is to be alive and to be human. So that's the end of my sermon. <laughs> I, uh, Dan, Dan has promised that there will be many questions based on the bearing of my soul here and exploration of the soul. So, but no, thank you all very much for coming to listen. And um, in particular, thank you to Dan for making this really awesome world and getting the music up, which I actually didn't get to explain, but this piece is called Spirit of the Wild by Nigel Westlake. And it was actually written in response to the, the founder of the Greens, Bob Brown, taking Nigel Westlake into the Tasmanian wilderness. And so it really, it, it's a, um, I'd say that piece is almost on my soul. <laughs> it's almost entrenched in, in my being. So yeah, thank you all very much for coming. And I'm yeah, open to lot, questions. Yeah. I don't want to hog all the questions, so I'm waiting, holding my breath. For... <laughs> <laughs> but I have plenty. Did somebody I have want to um, ask something? Very good. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering what you think about um, about the role of. Um, I kind of want to say learning, but really, it's creating knowledge in the way that um, David Deutsch. Um, physicist, have, has anyone come across him and his writings? Mm -hmm. I so have he, not personally. I mean, he he's um, he's, he uh, talks about the primacy, if you like, of explanatory knowledge, um, and without going too deep into that, um, he associates that strongly with joy. Like I think, type one fun is more like pleasure. And I completely agree that type two fun is, is joy. And that suffering on the journey is part of learning something new, like creating, instantiating new knowledge within yourself. And I, and I, while I resonate with everything you say about wildness and experience it myself, I've had some very similar ex experiences um, to, to what you describe. I also, um, I was on a roller coaster, which is type one fun, with my younger kid uh, last year. And we went twice. And the first time we were at the front of the train of cars. And the second time we were at the back of the train of cars. And I, I, was, I um, was surprised by, I should have known better. I mean, I, I could have predicted it had I thought, but I didn't think. Um, about how quickly the back cars are whipped over the edge when the you know when the the, the train of cars falls uh, into a drop um, and thinking about that and realizing that I found joyful even though it's a roller coaster and primarily type one fun if you can call it that as I was fighting waves of nausea inflicted <laughs> on me by my child <laughs> um, so. Like, I think, um, I wonder, I, I, I wonder what you think about this kind of basis for joy, where you are emphasizing the wildness and beauty, which I don't disagree with at all. But I also am quite drawn to this, the, the sort of fundamentalness of knowledge creation and learning. Mm -hmm. And I think that also um, a core element of what makes us us makes us human which is actually something potentially very accessible to an ai in the future mm -hmm. i think that's a great question i think i think there's a lot in that i think um i guess part of 
knowledge creation you could sort of put in maybe the the beauty aspect of joy that I was talking about and particularly in mathematics I think it's true that when you both understand a concept that someone else has come up with but then also create it you know sort of to the extent that one can create or discover mathematics um when you have that sensation I think there's beauty in that as well and that's related to the creating of knowledge but I think the yeah the AI aspect to that I think is really interesting I wonder hmm I don't know I wonder if there's an interplay like I'm just sort of imagining and you know this is only based on the kind of AI that we can see at the moment which is in its very very early stages so I know there'll be more complex AI out there at some point but I do kind of wonder whether its internal reward functions will actually value that knowledge creation itself and like whether there is an interplay between the the type one and type two fun in doing that i'm not sure do you have any thoughts on that dan hmm. i think we shouldn't underestimate how profoundly complicated our representations of nature might become so i mean mm. Maybe our PDEs seem a bit simple to find as much value as we do in a sunset, but uh, the future is long, uh, and our explanatory theories and our knowledge might start to acquire part of the depth we see out there in the world as we get better at it. I think part of the scope that's opened up by AI is that we should... Uh, not imagine the future of our knowledge and our ability to experience reality is, is sort of as bounded as it currently is. Um, so I think we can become much more and incorporate much more of the wild. Uh, and maybe that's part of why AI is interesting. Um, mm. Thanks for the question. It's a really interesting point. You're welcome. Um, a minor apology for the length and rambling nature. <laughs> not at all not at all <laughs> that's very canadian i have to say <laughs> yeah i i'm i'm sorry for the apology <laughs> that's, what, that's what i was i was hoping to prompt exactly that <laughs> um, we have uh we need to move on to the next talk in about eight minutes but uh i uh i hope there are more questions do you want to ask one dan yeah um how does all this relate to your interest in mathematics? Uh, I mean, maybe it's hard to say exactly, but uh, I don't think it's an accident that you are the kind of person who's both drawn to uh, is drawn to both of these types of fun. Uh, I mean, both of these instances of type two fun. Um, mm. you're, 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 you're like built to seek meaning in this kind yeah. of activity, and maybe that's all it is. Maybe it's just you know that's. Uh, two things you're interested in they don't have to be related but i have a feeling they might be mm -hmm. i think the starting point there in the seeking of type two fun is definitely um definitely rooted in the very privileged background that i've had myself and the very privileged upbringing because that you know in going back to what i said about the human objective function probably starting with survival and then going to this kind of actualization or the void, as I put it, the survival question has never been a problem for me. And I've been very, very, very lucky to have that. And I'm keenly aware of it. And so I think that means that that void <laughs> probably opened up pretty quickly as like, hmm, okay, so then what? <laughs> and I've always been very inquisitive by nature and I think that as we were talking about this this sort of duality between beauty and wild and and my I actually have written down something before which I think I said to you the other day 
I seek to understand what I can understand so that I can know what I can never understand. And somehow I think in that is my interest in maths and wildness because I think the maths is the part where you get to understand the beauty to the extent that we can as a civilization, right? And then once you've kind of done that and you're like, all right, there's some level of structure. I understand um, how this part of the world works, how this part of physics works as far as we can tell. Then that kind of clears the way to see an even deeper kind of mysticism. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll brush all of the maths to the side because I get that bit. So like that's the mystical or the wild deeper in there and so i think yeah i i think there's some relation there do you have a better theory than me <laughs> <laughs> no i don't think i would dare to insert into that comment uh, any of my own uh, thoughts um yeah, I'd like to say thanks for preparing this talk. I think this is a very hard talk or tour to give. Uh, it's harder to be honest and uh, talk clearly about these kinds of things than it is to talk about math. So I really appreciate you sharing this. Thank you very much for the opportunity to do so. Um, and I, I actually was thinking to myself when I was preparing it, I was like, God, like giving a sort of you know pseudo philosophical <laughs> talk. It's very, it's very hard coming from a maths background where you're so used to truth, yeah. right, and proof, and you're like, all right, definition, we can prove this thing. We're not sure about this one yet, but maybe some rough intuition about this, and then you kind of present this philosophy, and you're like, oh, <laughs> these are just based on trying to wrangle together various empirical things and anecdotes and appealing to some level of deep human to intuition about it and stuff so it was very interesting to to bring all these thoughts together mm. may one day our puny creations be worthy of uh places such as the overland track yes <laughs> <laughs> well that yeah that does um i guess just in the last minute dan and i were talking about how one can create wildness in meta uni and i think um so much of this wildness is dependent on a very long compute time and allowing this kind of emergent behavior to happen it's not something that i can speak to in a great deal of technical detail yet but intuitively or you actually put it quite well dan saying that like um you might how did you put it that you only get out as much as you put in 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 essence although maybe i don't know i think it's a really interesting topic how can one create wildness from sort of finitely complex systems i suppose which is kind of all that we ever have at our disposal yeah, you could say nature is finite, just big. Um, so yes, maybe it's, well, it's that, not like a true infinity. It's, it's, we don't need infinity to get get our hit. On that yes, note, and I guess uh, yeah. Sorry, I could, go ahead. I'll just finish by saying, like, I guess that was kind of the point of me saying that I don't think the AI can get to human level in like the lifetime of humanity itself. It's like if you left it to run long enough, then maybe but those time scales are important yeah i think what you mean is that it won't it won't replicate the value that is in the species or in humanity and there will always be something mm. more to us uh that doesn't mean the ais could easily do every economic task that we find yes. valuable yep. in terms of like you know whatever uh digging yep. holes and yep. building yep. fancy machines uh but so you're not denying that, but you're saying that there's plenty left over that in some intrinsic way relies on uh, quantities of computation that are not easy to replicate. Mm. Mm -hmm. That's a good way of articulating it. 
Thank you, everyone, for listening. Yeah, thank you very much. That was great.